Hey y'all, this is Mike and Chuck coming to you again over the internet. We're going to be discussing probably the most uh, popular passage in the Bible, John chapter 3, where Jesus meets Nicodemus. But before we get there, we got to have a little levity. So Chuck's going to share the story. Yeah, so uh, Mike and I, we basically, we got married at the same time. We were each other's best men at each other's wedding. Uh, we even had our firstborns, what, two weeks apart or something yeah, like that? that close, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was very close. So we both had boys. And so uh, we, we both have these little critters that we have no clue what to do. Our wives saved our bacon. But, you know, men with their young infant sons, uh, we want to play and help them grow. <laughs> I'm already laughing. We want to help them grow up. So uh, we take our sons. <laughs> <laughs> we take them to the park <laughs> and there's a circle. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Mike, you're going to have to miss the okay. <laughs> So we're, we're out there and we're figuring, hey, they, they'd really enjoy this, right? So we take them to the top of this curly Q slide and uh, our wives are watching this from a distance. <laughs> and just about the time we released the baby, <laughs> I think it was Michael that went first and his tennis shoe gets caught on the side of the slide and he starts tumbling head over heels down this slide. <laughs> Meanwhile, the wives are running at us, no! No, <laughs> we're like, what? It's just a slide. <laughs> oh my goodness. So you can tell what kind of dads we are. Uh, it's pretty funny now, but our wives were not laughing, that's for sure. So uh, I, I got tickled. I still Sorry. hear about that from time to time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, time to get serious, right? Yeah. So uh, let me pull up the passage that we're going to read. And Mike, I'll let you read so I can get control of myself. <laughs> okay. All right, John chapter 3, verse 1 from Nasby 95 says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, Nicodemus said to him, How can one be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lift up the, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that, whatever, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. 
This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. All right. So here we have Nicodemus uh, kind of sneaking in, slinking <laughs> in to uh, ask Jesus some questions at night. And um, so Jesus has this discussion with Nicodemus and it seems like he believes, trying to believe. Mike, what, what's going on with Nicodemus's belief? This is one of those these instances where the chapters sometimes keep you from, they interrupt the flow of the text, right? At the mm -hmm. end of chapter two, uh, it says that there were many in Jerusalem that believed him because of the signs that he was doing, but he was not entrusting himself to them. And then it immediately launches into the Nicodemus story. So Nicodemus was one of those who was impressed by the signs, but I think a little dubious about Jesus status. And uh, I think he was trying to, when he comes and calls him rabbi or teacher, that's really quite an honor. Uh, here's the senior teacher in Israel calling a 30 year old rabbi. Uh, and it was almost like Nicodemus expected him to, to be humbled by that. And oh, thank you for you know, acknowledging that I'm part of the rabbi club. <laughs> so yeah. Nicodemus was curious about the signs and jesus has a a record for not thinking much of those who are only responding to signs you know yeah yeah and it it seems like you know the way that nicodemus approaches jesus he was concerned about other things he was probably concerned about the way he would look to the other religious leaders by kind of snuggling up to Jesus. And it reminds me of the parable of the sower where, you know, some people spring up with joy. That's the second soil. And, uh, and then to quickly fall away because of persecution of the word. So, you know, there's some there's some things that Nicodemus needs to work on. I think he gets it right in the end, but yeah, yeah, I think so too. So he's intrigued, but not convinced, I think, at this point. Yeah, and Jesus answers him very abruptly and in typical Jesus fashion goes straight to the heart of the matter and says, You must be born again. What is what is that about, and why must we be born again? Yeah, I go back to uh, Genesis chapter two, where God tells Adam and Eve, hey, you can eat from any tree in the garden, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in that day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And Satan comes and you know, he counters the word of God with instilling doubt. Will you really die if you eat this? Mm. And it's interesting that when Eve takes a big bite out of whatever fruit that was, she did not die mm. physically, <laughs> but immediately she died spiritually. And that's the first of three deaths, spiritual death, physical death, and eternal death. And so the deceiver, he capitalized on our weakness, not seeing the spiritual. But yep. what do you think, Mike? Well, I, I, uh, that was not as obvious to me as you just made it. <laughs> when I was studying this, I thought, why do we need to be born again? And I went back to the same passage, but that was kind of a revelation for me. I thought, oh yeah, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, right? So in order to have life, we need to be spiritually reborn. So I, I think 
you hit it right on the head. That's what it's all about. And something that Nicodemus should have been familiar with, right? Uh, there are a, a number of other metaphors that Jesus uses for, for this uh, experience process, <laughs> the salvation experience of being reconciled to God. Born again is just one of them. But yep. uh, in the very next chapter, he, with the woman at the well, we'll talk about that next week. He says it's like water gushing up in your soul, you know, that mm. will cause you never to thirst again. So an eternal uh, satisfaction or reconciliation with God. In the Old Testament, it's called uh, circumcision of the heart, you know, cutting away the dead flesh. Or that you see it in the Ezekiel 37 when uh, Ezekiel prophesies to the wind and the wind blows on the bones and the, and the dead bones become alive again. So... Uh, lots of metaphors for this very miraculous, mysterious experience that Jesus is talking about. Yeah, uh, and I, I remember uh, Christians making fun of people that just came to Christ and saying, oh, you're one of those born again Christian. In other words, I'm stuck in the mud in my faith and you're on fire. And that's <laughs> what that meant. You know, they're sold out. You have a lot of zeal. Yeah. Man, I wish that I was born again every day. You know, <laughs> that's my desire. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, here Jesus compares the experience to the wind, right? And how, how is the spirit like the wind? Uh, this is such a good question. I, I remember wrestling with this idea and having just kind of a thought that freed me up because Jesus says he's like the wind. You don't know where he's coming and where he's going. This is the mysteriousness of God personified, you know, that... Um, God is going to do what God is going to do, and it's for his best interest, his glory, and our best interest. And quite frankly, we are mystified mm -hmm. by the things that God does and the way that he does them. And so I could go on and on about things I've seen in my life where I was just... I was the RCA dog, you know. <laughs> I don't get this, Jesus. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know how you're going to make a train wreck into something good, you know. Yeah. Well, just the very fact that Jesus and the Bible use so many different metaphors to try to explain the experience of being born again tells you that it's difficult to understand, you know. It's not something we can package and, uh, you know, uh, export neatly to somebody and, and just pray this prayer one two three abc you're good to go right yeah so yeah. uh that's the that's what jesus is trying to get across here uh he, he asked about, go ahead the, the dissension over the holy spirit in the body of christ you know it, it's amazing. You start talking about the Holy Spirit, and man, it don't, it's almost like fighting words over the disagreements that we have. Yeah. This is why I like going back to this passage. Hey, guess what? None of us have all the answers. <laughs> None of us, except for God, the omniscient one. Yeah. So. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts, right? Yeah, yeah. So Jesus kind of challenges Nicodemus because he says, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? So in other words, he was holding him accountable. He should have understood this, that Jesus was talking about. Uh, should he have and why didn't he? Yes, he should have because he's a teacher in Israel and he's in the scriptures. And this, this is a good kind of exhortation for us too. And John 5, 39, when we get there, Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think in them, you find eternal life. The scriptures point to me. The only thing that Nicodemus and his fellow religious leaders missed was the boat. 
<laughs> you know, they had missed Jesus in the whole thing. And that's what the Old Testament was pointing to. So uh, Jesus is going to hold them accountable. He's going to hold his disciples accountable. And he's going to hold us accountable. So, uh, yes. Uh, but Yeah, he's, uh, I thought about this. I thought, uh, what would be an example of one of the Old Testament figures who was clearly born again? And the first one that jumped to mind was David, you know, the man after God's own heart. But any one of them that's going to be in the kingdom had to have experienced this uh, inner encounter with the spirit. They had to have been born again. Maybe Isaiah, when he saw the, yeah. the, 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 uh, the throne room of God and the angel puts the coal to his lip. Uh, so all of them had to have experiences like this. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So, what are the earthly things that uh, Jesus is talking about versus the heavenly things? He kind of, you know, alludes to these things. If I talk about earthly metaphors and things like that, how will you understand the heavenly, eternal? What yeah. is he trying to communicate there? Well, he, it's interesting that at this point he says, we testify of earthly things. Well, who's mm -hmm. we? I think we is the Holy Spirit and Jesus, right? So these things, if you're a true believer, the Spirit should have testified or be testifying to you along with Jesus who's standing right there, right? And he says, look, I've been talking to you about earthly things. In other words, this born again experience is something you can experience on earth right now. You know, uh, this is something you should know about. Now, let me really blow your mind with some heavenly things. Right? And that's yeah. when he says, unless the son of man is lifted up as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. Well, now that's infinitely deeper. You know, this heavenly transaction that happened on the cross where God gave his son as a substitute for us, he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And in some mysterious way, we were crucified with him. Mm. That's way deeper than talking about this experience of being born again. So I think uh, mm. the the heavenly things are is the the cross as a mechanism uh, for this being born again. And nobody can be born again apart from the cross, right? Yeah, uh, and that's what he's getting at there. I think. Yeah, and then we should all strive to mature in our understanding. You know, I feel like Nicodemus sometimes, you know, or a lot of the time. Uh, that's why I lean on my brother, Mike, you know, <laughs> hey, what does this mean? Uh, but that just because we don't understand today does not alleviate us from the responsibility of trying to understand tomorrow. And so I think this underscores the need for us to pray for understanding as we read the scriptures, as we listen to people speak. You know, you're listening to two knuckleheads on YouTube here. <laughs> You better be praying that the Holy Spirit would give you guidance and understanding. Yeah. So. I would not have in a million years linked the snake on a stick to the cross. Yeah. Unless Jesus yeah. had revealed that, there is no way I would have ever gotten that right. No. In so. fact, that would probably come up with the opposite. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So... He's kind of said to Nicodemus, you ought to be aware of these things. Uh, they're deep, but there are deeper things. Uh, and the spirit blows where he wills. You can't, you don't have any control over that. So what can we do to be born again? Yeah, I think Jesus, he talked about being born again. So he should be the authority on how to be born again. And he says, repent the kingdom of God is at hand, believe in the gospel. And so the first thing is change your stinking thinking. <laughs> you're, it, let's just admit it, uh, or I'll admit it. I'm a selfish cuss, okay? 
<laughs> I want things my way. And, you know, that's just me. But I had to come to God and kill that, surrender that and say, not my way, but your way. And mm. Jesus does that, not my will, but your will. Yeah. And that's a condition of the heart. It's a condition of your head and your actions are going to follow that. And you must believe that God loves you so much that he sent this incredible gift in his son to reconcile you to himself by dying for all your selfishness, your sins. So did I leave anything out? No, I think that's exactly it. What, what we can do is believe. And we do that sometimes in fits and starts, you know. <laughs> I'm reminded of the man who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, right? Yeah. So I think it's being honest with ourselves and about our need for a savior and our own sin and believing that God has a remedy for that in Jesus. And that's all we can do uh, then before the spirit does his work on our heart, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, pretty, pretty, uh, abrupt confrontation with the teacher of Israel, right? What, what is the average human reaction to confrontation and how would do we respond when God confronts us with our own sin? We've been doing this since the garden. Run and hide and then blame somebody else. <laughs> and so we've been doing that. Uh, it can't be me. You know, it cannot. I'm not that bad. You know, no, no. <laughs> I, I remind people when we're sharing the gospel and we're talking about sin, and if they're not going there with me, I ask them, can you even abide by your own personal standards? <laughs> How many times have you violated your own rules, let alone God's rules? So, uh, uh, Mike, what do you think about yeah, I think I'm reminded of that, that OER bullet that says fails to meet even his own low standards. <laughs> that, that's us. But man, why is it so hard for us to admit that we're boneheads? You know, it's obvious to everybody around us. It should be pretty obvious to us. But I, I think that's exactly it, is that our response is pride and hide you know to say oh well it's you know uh, she needs to get over that if somebody's offended by me well i didn't i didn't do anything wrong blah 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 and rather than going huh maybe you know think it through and maybe i did say something that was out of order or, you know we don't even we don't give it a chance before we start rationalizing and justifying and hiding because of our pride right yeah in fact uh it's very interesting what happens to us when we walk in the light, when we confess our sin to God, and when we confess our sins to one another. We think it's going to be disaster. Actually, it's freedom. Hmm. It's, it's joy. It's peace when we walk in the light. I had to confess some sin to our church the other night. Pride, fear, Envy. Mm -hmm. I, I had to say, hey, I just want to confess that this thing raises ugly head in my heart. I felt accepted and I felt free when I did that. Yeah. So. Maybe folks are, because they have a poor image of who God is, are afraid that if they confess, he's going to squash them like a bug, you know? Yeah. So their only hope is to try to uh justify themselves and, and hide their sin which is crazy because now is the time to get it out in the open and receive the forgiveness that's offered because it's only offered for so long you know? yeah yeah so he, here nicodemus is getting a straight scoop from jesus this is how you entered the kingdom this is how you get eternal life and he balks, but 
a lot of people balk at this good news. Why don't they believe? Why do they reject this well, good news? Well, I think hiding in pride is big, but in Nicodemus, Nicodemus's case, put yourself in his shoes. This guy's got a PhD in theology, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus is telling him, you missed the boat, man. You don't know the first thing <laughs> about uh, the kingdom of God. And so that's really hard for him to swallow, I'm sure, at this point. Uh, to his credit, he's thinking about it. You know, he's at least inquiring and not just outright eject, rejecting Jesus like some of his peers did, right? So I think he's experiencing those same things. He's uh, brought up short by the fact that I've been at this all my life and I haven't got a clue, right? Uh, yeah. Had to hurt, had to be uh, wounded pride there. Yeah. So ultimately, what, what was Nicodemus' outcome? Yoga bear. <laughs> it ain't over till it's over. Yeah. And we see the compassion of Nicodemus with Joseph of Arimathea in the end, taking the time to take the body of Jesus off the cross and put it in a tomb in the great respect. I think that Nicodemus was converted. That's a guess. I don't know. What do you think? I, I agree. And you can see that to, to have done that would have been really cross currents with his peers. Mm. And both he and Joseph of Arimathea chose to do that openly. Uh, they went to the governor and asked for the body. You know? So um, to me, what we see is a real success story that takes a little time to percolate, you know? <laughs> and, and we ought to be willing to give folks that time that they need to process this stuff. Yeah, yeah. In fact, if you don't give time for people to work it out and mentally and, you know, to really believe you, you end up twisting their arm. Yes. And then was it real? I mean, their second or third soul at both in the parable of the sower. Yeah. I call that inoculating people to the gospel. Yeah. When we, when we force them to part, you know, we, I shouldn't say force, but we influence them. <laughs> into praying this prayer and then saying, okay, you're good to go. You don't know that. You don't know how the, what's going on in that person's spirit, you know? Just give them the good news and let the spirit do his work, you know? Yeah, yeah. Then they're for the rest of their life going, well, I prayed the prayer in VBS, so I'm good. And they're not processing stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Well, and we got a notch in our belt so we can report, you know, I saved, you didn't save anybody. <laughs> Come on, you know, and let's see what the spirit does yeah. with what you said. Yeah, I agree. So we went over the head. How about the heart? How does this make us feel? Well, for me, it's just when I had my born again experience it was black and white it was i thought i was the first one to ever figure this out you know <laughs> that, that uh life-changing uh, moment for me so i'm just reminded of that and so thankful that the spirit chose to blow on me you know yeah. and uh great it was you know i'm standing sitting here today because of that day and in August 25th, 1979, you know, that it has completely rerouted my life. Yeah. Uh, I look at it. I, I was Nicodemus without the education. <laughs> I was super proud of myself, but I didn't have anything to be proud of, you know, <laughs> and I had heard the gospel a year earlier, but it took the bottom to fall out for me to pray my big, long theological prayer. Yeah. Okay, God, you know, <laughs> I surrendered at that point. And I, I feel humbled because, um, you know, like Nicodemus, I didn't want to give some things up. I, I felt like there were some things I was hanging on to that I counted more important 
than my relationship with God. Mm. And so I, I, I feel Nicodemus's pride. I feel his hesitancy, you know? So that's very humiliating, but praise God, he didn't give up on me yeah. or Nicodemus. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, next week we're gonna talk in John four and compare Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well to the nobleman and his sick son. And uh, we'll see again that uh, it's most of the time through crisis that we respond to the Lord. Uh, and Jesus was a little frustrated with that. He, I think he'd much rather have that great conversation that he had with the woman at the well, where she was asking honest questions and seeking a relationship with him. She didn't necessarily have a crisis. I mean, her life went great, but she uh she's asking good questions and he's super satisfied by that interaction but when the guy's coming to him with his hair on fire you know he, he was he he by the grace of god because jesus is who he is he granted his request but he was not nearly as satisfied with that interaction so anyway that's a preview for next week yeah yeah so we got our heads full our hearts full and the hands so I really feel like I need to share the gospel with patience. Uh, I was sharing the gospel last week with some guys and I felt like it was kind of a drive-by gospel sharing and I need to slow down. Mm -hmm. So that's my application for this week is to share the gospel and savor the flavor. <laughs> yeah, I think, for me, it's realize that you are uh, one of many who are having input into this person's life. Yeah. And your job is not to lay some theology on them necessarily. It's just to share the good things that God has done in your life. And that is adding to what the spirit is doing in their life, right? And whether or not they come around in your conversation or in some later conversation is immaterial. Uh, your job is to bear witness, to testify as to what God has done in your life. Well, not, not to be a theology prop to the man on the street. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it's been good being with you all. We love you. God bless you. And until next time, keep following Jesus. See y'all.